Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit WPSU.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at WPSU.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on American feeling in the room was You probably don't ever say to her that her point about the Chicago incident. She's qualified for services. Ethical. We left. More of a community. We're trying to back over. doing in autism. Brian Ross has been working in news for nearly 40 years, first with NBC, then with ABC. His investigative reports have exposed governmental corruption and led to reforms both in the U.S. and abroad. Ross was one of the leading investigators of the Bernie Madoff scandal. His reporting on the subject led to the New York Times best-selling book, The Madoff Chronicles, Inside the Secret World of Bernie and Ruth. Over the course of his career, Ross has covered international human rights abuses, corruption in government, and secret CIA prisons in Eastern Europe, among other things. From DuPonts to Peabody's, Ross has been repeatedly honored with the most prestigious awards in journalism, including 12 Emmys and three Edward R. Murrow Awards. Here's our conversation with Brian Ross. Brian Ross, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. You're here on the campus of Penn State, an invited guest of the Penn State Forum, which is Penn State's version of the National Press Club. And you gave a talk just a little bit ago called Scam, Scoundrels, and Scoundrels, the Life of an Investigative Reporter. From what I'm gathering, uh, the life of an investigative reporter is an exciting one, a demanding one, and a dangerous one. It can be dangerous. Uh, really, some of the danger is just making sure you get the story right. But there have been times when I've had real brushes, you know, real physical confrontations. Uh, I've ended up in a couple of dicey situations. Uh, hijacking, uh, held at gunpoint. Um, get the, getting the story right, though, is, is something you just mentioned. And, and you've been sued 13 times. And while you won all 13 of those, you say it still takes it out of you. I, is the motive, do you think, behind some of them an effort to keep investigative journalists from doing what you do? I think so. But, you know, the system is that, that you're, you're free to sue anybody you want. and. Uh, uh, some of it is I think people feel they almost have an obligation to sue just to sort of say, I don't agree with this. Uh, I was sued by the Prime Minister of the Bahamas after we reported on allegations that through a, a bag man he had been taking payoffs from the Colombia uh, drug cartels. And I think that really just culturally he had no choice but to, he had to more than deny it, he had to sue us. And he actually sued us in Canada where the First Amendment doesn't protect us. And, it was looking like it was going to be a long, protracted lawsuit, except under oath, when he was required to testify, he admitted pretty much all that we had reported because he, I think he was a, a barrister himself, trained in London, and I think he just couldn't bring himself under oath to tell a falsehood. And after that testimony, the next day the suit was dropped, went away. So in some ways he wasn't the, maybe as, as big as, or deep a scoundrel as, as some of the others you right. covered. Right. He, he did have me burned in effigy. I won't forget that soon. <laughs> in the streets of Nassau in the Bahamas. And uh, it was difficult. Uh, I haven't been back there since, actually, because I was threatened with criminal libel action by his lawyer, F. Lee Bailey. Uh, and I've always thought not a, not, a, not a safe place. I'm sure it's different, much different now, but that was a time when it was, um, you know, drugs were rampant here. They were coming in from everywhere, and the Bahamas had become sort of a, a way station. They'd drop them off there, and they'd trans them into, into Florida on the fast cigarette boats that we see on Miami Vice. But that was, that was real at that time, and it wasn't possible without some kind of official corruption. And that's really what I end up focusing on a lot is, you know, where, where the government fails or where it's on the take. And this is something you've been doing since your very, very early days in television. Back in the early 1970s, I think one of the first stories you covered was uh, corruption during the state fair in Waterloo, Iowa. Yes, uh, and, and Iowa, you know, you wouldn't think there's corruption, but there are questions about you know, the deals at the state fair. And uh, uh, I, I ended up getting fired from my first job in Iowa. Uh, I did a story about um, a highway, a super highway, to be built to the doors of the John Deere tractor factory. And, and the owner of the station was the head of the Chamber of Commerce in uh, Blackhawk County, Iowa. And uh, everybody was for this highway, he told me, but we knew the people whose homes were going to be covered by the highway were not for Eminent it. Eminent domain. And when they uh, scheduled a big protest one weekend, we got orders that wasn't a story not to cover it. And being fresh out of journalism school and knowing everything there was to know in the world, <laughs> I say sarcastically, uh, we went out and covered it and put it on the air, which you could do in a small station on the weekends. 
but you paid the price Monday morning. I was out the door. That was the launch of out my the career. Door to, yeah, the launch <laughs> of your career is right. Uh, what have you learned in 40 years of, of covering scams and scandals and, and scoundrels about human nature, about what makes one person put their hand in the cookie jar and, and not another who was really in the same, uh, had the same opportunity? Uh, it's generally money or sex, that's what it comes down to. At some level, you'll find that as a motivating factor for, uh, for the s scoundrels of this world. Uh, you know, there are people that have no conscience, like, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff, I think, had no conscience. Uh, there are others who are greedy. There are others who sort of, sort of get caught up in a system they can't get out of, and they benefit from it, so they, they don't challenge it. And, you know, it's tough to be, to challenge an entrenched system. You know, and I always admire the whistleblowers, and they're unusual people because they sort of act like most normal people wouldn't. They, they're offended by slights and by small things, and they, they really hold the institutions to a high standard. And when they're not met, they, they are determined to blow the whistle. And I live off those people, and I think what they do is invaluable. And it's very, very American, I think, to stand up to power and authority. But it seems more difficult these days to be a whistleblower. And I'm referring to another story that you helped uh, uh, uncover, and that's in 19, uh, or in 2006, when you and some other reporters found out that the federal government was tracking your phone calls. Yes, well, that that is uh, what we were told by someone. Uh, one of my colleagues was told, "You got to stay off the phone because we know who you're calling." Very troubling, and uh, you know that was invoked uh, as a national security investigation, and we were talking about problems in national security, and uh, that's that's what led to that investigation. You know, I'm, I'm troubled by the state using national security as an excuse or a cover to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. And that, I think it's too often being uh, used in this country as a reason to do things that, you know, really don't live up to our ideals and values. Has it changed the way you uh, source your stories? Are you now going, uh, I just have this vision of you in a car driving from uh, payphone to payphone with a bag of quarters. Right. Is that what it's reduced you to? Uh, well, you can't find a payphone anymore. Well, so that's true, we, too. You end up getting uh, phones that aren't uh, through the company. There's some tricks of the trade that way. You get phones that are, you know, sort of... Um, yeah, the way you operate almost like an espionage agent, uh, you know, one-time use, and you use it, and then it doesn't show up, so they can't get your phone records. The government now can get phone records without you knowing it, and they, uh, if they subpoena ABC News for my phone records, uh, ABC would fight it, but at some point if we lose it, you know, we'll obey a court order. And so uh, we have to do it different ways, a lot more meetings in person. Uh, you know, there are ways around it, and uh, we only do it because we think we're doing a service, you know, for the country. You know, we don't do it for any other reason than that. It's not a gotcha thing. It's like some, some, of, the, some of the information is very valuable and should be known to the public. That's our view. The truth is the reporting that you and other investigative reporters do, it does have the potential to harm people. What's the litmus test for you to say, this is my personal philosophy of the, the story I will pursue and the story I won't pursue? Well, you know, in terms of what I will, I, I want to go after every story that I think is meaningful. And then by, by that, I mean where we're going after, you know, I don't want to go after the small fry. You know, this is, I want to take this to the highest possible authority in, in every case. And if it's a consumer story, I want to take it to the head of the corporation that's making the bad product, for instance, you know, if it's Toyota or, or bad tires. I, I want to challenge at the highest level and also challenge a government that allows it to happen. And I think that's, that's really our role. And, uh, if we do that and we stay true to ourselves that way, you know, we, there's, a, there's a bright future for us. That's, what, that's our contract, essentially, with, mm -hmm. with the country. It is, uh, to borrow the Republican phrase, but that, that's our deal with our viewers. You know, we are going to go out and ask the tough questions that you know, the average person can't because they don't have the time or the energy or the access that, that we get, but we only get it because we speak for our viewers. You know, CBS, the president, I think, of CBS said that Brian Ross is the gold standard of investigative reporting. Um, your profession, uh, professional organization, uh, investigative uh, reporters and, and editors, editors um, also hold you to that same standard. But then there's also bloggers who, who I'm sure you know, well, sometimes sure. criticize oh, the sure, stories sure. that you've told. They say you're, uh, you'll tell... Uh, 
bad stories about Republicans, but but give uh, Democrats a, a free pass. Right. How do you respond to that? Well, listen, that's that's lively debate, and you know I I can hardly sit here and say I don't like you know I, I criticize others. I do tough stories. I have to expect it. You know the people are welcome to look at what I do and form their opinions and and give their opinions. And lots of people don't like the stories I do, and you know sort of left and right and all kinds of things. And it's not as if we don't make mistakes too. And we we can and we do, but you know I I just think that's so healthy in a way, even though sometimes you know uh, you got to like keep growing that skin so it gets thick. But I think that's very healthy in this country that we you know nobody's above criticism or reproach. And you know a, a blogger is is free to have the, the view that he wants of me or my reporting or the president of the United States or anybody at all. I just think it's a terrific thing. And I'm not a person who sort of is afraid of the lively debate on cable news. I think it's terrific if people are committed, they're interested in the issues. You know, we have to all sort of have a set of facts that we base our opinions on. But if we can get those right, then opinions are opinions, and we, we, that's terrific. The truth is you're a blogger yourself these yeah. days. You right. Twitter, you blog, and in a way it seems to me that, that uh, the media has come for full circle because in the early days, um, Pamphleteers were kind of the early right. bloggers of our day. Right. I think it's interesting though because there's a there's a tagline on on the blotter, which is ABC's uh, blog, and it says we're journalists, not bloggers. Yeah, and, and we sort of made that point at, because I I think for me at least, and I think for the audience, bloggers might mean that we're giving our opinions on something. And we work hard to play it. You know, here's what we know as a fact. That, and you can come to us for the information, and then off that, you know, make decide what you want to do. You you form your opinions, but I don't come to it and write a story with my opinion is this or my opinion is that, and it varies, you know, story to story. And really, the people I work with um, at ABC News and the ABC News investigative team, you know, you'd have a hard time figuring out what anybody's political affiliation was. I mean, what we like is a good story. What does it take? for your investigative team to do what you do, and I should say that you're a feeder really for uh, Good Morning America, 2020, ABC News Radio, The Blotter. Well, what David Weston, I think, was describing and, and has been the reality of how he's carried out the changes, and, and he's leaving now, but w what he saw and was that what we have to do to be different is original investigative or enterprise reporting. And he has put the resources out of sort of generalized news coverage and too fancy production and focus them more on, on our team, the investigative team. We have a very vibrant uh, medical unit, uh, original reporting, and that's where he thinks, and many, I think, agree with him, is really the future of broadcast news. I mean, by, by 6.30 at night, lots of things that are going on we kind of know. But I hope that our viewers tune in, you know, World News with Diane Sawyer or on, Di on Nightline or in the morning at GMA to see, you know, our, how we dig into it, what makes this different. You know, distinctive reporting will distinguish ABC News, and at least that's our commercial business plan. That's how we plan to be successful. Now, is the blotter kind of your test balloon? Let's put it out on the blotter and see. Well, you know, I, would, I kind of think of the yeah. Mark Foley story, sure. which really sure. took off, and I want to talk no, about that in just exactly. a minute. Exactly. It's, you know, it's not really a test balloon. The, the same standards apply to what's on online on the blotter as to what's on World News or on 2020. The same people go over it with us, we bring the same reporting standards, but it may not be as big a story. You know, World News, uh, there are six stories, seven stories a night, you know, in a minute and a half or a minute 45 each. Might be all the time you get. So that's just, that's really essentially all we get there is the front page. The World News with Diane Sawyer is a terrific broadcast, but it's the front page. Lots of other stories that we just don't have room for. And so some of those end up online or on other broadcasts. But you know, I, I work in a place now where if, if I have a good story and I can't find a place to get it on Good Morning America or World News or Nightline or 2020 or online, then it probably isn't a good story, frankly. Now, the, the, the Mark Foley, the, the Florida right. congressman who right. was involved in, in a sex scandal with Young Pages, that is a story that, that, that you first brought to the American public on the blotter. That's right. It's a story that had been circulating in a way among the press for at least 11 months prior to it. That's and right. it's one that the Pointner Institute and others have used as, a, as an example to say, Brian Ross 
followed the lead and he broke this story and, and why did you others miss it? Right. We, and, what do you say to that? Well, that is true. I mean, I don't know why the others missed it, but I know what, what we knew was that there was a uh, paid, these are high school students, it's a very prestigious thing. You know, the best and the brightest kids get these jobs to go be a page for a year in Washington. They live in a special dorm. They're supposed to be watched closely. Nothing untoward is supposed to happen. There have been previous scandals, especially you're supposed to keep a close eye on them. So we got a report of this one page from Louisiana um, who started getting uh, strange emails from Mark Foley. Now, Foley wasn't even his congressman, which made it even stranger. Mm. Um, do you work out in the gym? Would you like something special for your birthday? Will you send me a photo? And at the time, my son was about the same age. And I thought, if I was the father of this boy, I would be, what, this is funny. You know, no grown man should be sending these messages. But it wasn't like a, you know, it wasn't like a slam dunk. And a talk with uh, Charlie Gibson and John Banner, who uh, run World News at that time. Charlie's not there anymore. But uh, they were running the World News program. It wasn't quite enough to be on the World News. So we wrote a story to go online on the blotter saying questions raised about emails. And uh, Foley's response to that before we uh, published it was, uh, you know, I may sue you. Uh, others said, you have to know Mark, just a friendly guy. If you got to know him, Brian, come on down. So we went ahead and, and did the story. Uh, within two hours after publishing the story on a Thursday, we began to receive a stream of messages online from other high school pages who said, that's nothing. And they sent us this whole stream of extremely sexually explicit back and forths between Paley and these high school pages. Um, and that was stunning. And then the question was, well, how do we prove that was Mark Foley? Did somebody just, a political opponent perhaps, doing this to embarrass him? And so the next day, uh, one of the producers I work with, I said, give Foley's press people a call. We'll see what we're going to have here. I thinking it would be a story for the following week. Within two hours, uh, they'd call back and said, yes, those are Mark's emails. He's going to resign. Instant messages, not emails, instant messages. He's going to resign. And you can have the exclusive on the resignation as long as you agree not to publish the text of the messages. Oh, my goodness. That was the deal they wanted to cut. And, and did you abide by that no, deal? No, of course no, not. I didn't no. think so. I didn't you, think so. you can't make you, that deal that's with me. Right. In and fact, so, and so it broke on AP to say he's resigning. They didn't know the story. And then we followed up in about 20 minutes, you know. That's not the first time someone has tried to make some deals with you. When, when the D.C. Madam story broke, you had bigwigs in, in government uh, saying, can I give you another story that would be more interesting <laughs> right. than the one you're working yeah, on? And, that, and, that and ultimately, was, you didn't name names anyway. We named a few names, but uh, one of the, like, perhaps the highest ranking person who was an assistant secretary of state who was implicated there, um, he uh, resigned. So we couldn't, you know, even before we got the story, I, I gave him two weeks thinking that was the right thing to do, and he went ahead and quit. So, The, the blog is an interesting, uh, the, the blotter and the blog is an interesting, um, you know, new tool in, in this media landscape. 36 million people a year uh, are, are going to your blog. Uh, might be even bigger numbers now. It keeps, it keeps growing. I mean, it might be uh, 50 or 60, you know, if you compile it over the course of a year. But, you know, it, it is an exciting time for journalism, I think, because the ability to, to write that, to have control over it, uh, and to introduce video elements and to go beyond what can be on a limited time of a broadcast is very exciting. Plus the feedback from um, readers, viewers, whatever you want to call them. They Tips do, they do both. as well? Tips. Because you have a, a, a tip line. A, we, get, we get, I'd say every week, we get two or three very serious stories suggested to us. And follow-up comes quickly from people who are interested in the case. And, and that, to me, is just so exciting because, you know, before people would have to call and figure out how to get through the switchboard. Do I know? Where, where do I even find and, a number? And, it, and is someone going to ask for ask, Brian Ross? Exactly, you can. <laughs> I don't and think you, it's so. Not, it's not that difficult, but, you know, it, 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 people might think it was. Letters, you know, people don't write letters, really. And uh, this has changed a lot for journalists. You know, there's, there's really a way to connect better with the audience and, and to get a feel for where, you know, where it's going. Not to mention, you know, the comments that go back and forth and people kind of create this community where they're talking about stories. And it's just fascinating to see, you know. And we publish it all. And a lot of people come in and take whacks at us. And this is an outrageous story. And you're for the Democrats. You're for the Republicans. You're, you're, a, you know, you're not a patriot. Lots of things. Lots of criticism, which is terrific. I just, I just extol that. And I think it's wonderful to be in the middle of a situation where we're just, people are expressing their views on interests 
uh, that are you know current events and really topical and important issues for the country. Your time, though, is so divided, feeding all of these furnaces. Can you do the kind of in-depth legwork, investigative reporting uh, that, you know, the bread and butter of, of what you got into this for? Yeah, I mean, uh, but I don't do it alone. You know, you, you have me here. If you had everybody here, you'd have a big team behind me of, of producers that I've worked with for a lot of them, many of them for a long, long time, who are, uh, we're very close. We're, we are a team. It is the work of a team. You know, I appear on the air, but you know, those are reporters. We, the TV term is producers, but they really are. They're my colleagues as reporters. And you know, online at least, we try to you know, the bylines will be there'll be four or five bylines. You know, we're, we're very much involved. We've got ter a terrific team, you know, that we've been able to build under David Weston. And um, you know, it's we sometimes uh, will just drop everything to go after a big story. You know, the Fort Hood shooting with. Uh, Major Hassan, um, everybody stops everything and, and chases that. But otherwise, we're working on, I don't know, 10, 12 stories at any one time. Some long term that we love, but may take six months or a year. Some shorter term, you know, a month or so, and some that I hope to have on, you know, tomorrow or Monday. The skills required today uh, have changed a little bit in, in this in this new landscape. Writing sounds like it's absolutely critical. You may be the person holding the camera, but you probably also need to write. Yeah, if you if you're a journalism student and you can't write, you really you're not going to go far. Uh, you really aren't because the sort of the convergence of uh, the broadcast and the print media into one online, where it's both, requires everyone to write and know how to write and to write quickly and intelligently, you know, and with a, with a snap. And that's important and that's not as easy to find as you might think and we've made it really a, a complete, uh, you know, that's a, that's a deal breaker for us if you can't write you know, to get a job because we, we just can't have that and there's not going to be a future for people. And we found that um, you have a choice between somebody who can write well and doesn't know a lot about TV or someone who knows a lot about TV and, uh, you know, um, can't write. We take the person that can write well. Mm -hmm. It's easier to teach the TV part than the writing part. I want to move back for just a moment to your talk today, Scams, Scandals, and Scoundrels. You say of all of the people you've investigated in this 40-year career, uh, none compares to Bernie Madoff. No, really. He is a world-class scoundrel who began his uh, scam, uh, cheating investors, really around the same time I kind of began my career as a, as a reporter. And um, you know, he started almost from day one telling people he was investing in stocks and giving them rates of return. When it turns out over the entire career, he never bought a single stock or traded an option ever, zero. And he just took the money and then gave people 10 or 15 percent. And it's a Ponzi scheme. I say it should be called a Madoff scheme from now on. And that can, can continue as long as people continue to put their money in. And Madoff, was, kind of what his genius was to play hard to get. He would tell people, I'm not sure I can handle your money. And no, Bernie, I want you to take it. And and people would find friends. Can you get me in with Bernie? And and they did. And it turns out he took a lot of people's money. If he, if he added up all the fancy monthly statements he sent out, all the people who thought they had money with Madoff, if he added it all up, they thought at the time of when he was arrested, they probably had about sixty-two billion dollars. Mm. And not a penny of it invested, as you said. Zero, zero. In fact, if if his um, Sort of his scheme of how he was investing, if it actually had been the case, he would have had to own half of Microsoft and two thirds of Coca Cola, which is, you know, impossible. Uh, and he did this by essentially once a month, he and one of his right hand men, Frank DePascali, would sit down and look at the month's trading figures for stocks and say, all right, we bought GE on this day, which was the low day of the month. It's like looking at the yeah. winning lottery ticket the yeah. next day. Well, you can bet on a horse after the race, you're pretty sure to win. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what he did. And that's why he, the results look great. People are saying, Bernie's got that touch. He's got the secret sauce. And it was just a scam. And it went on for so long, in large part because the Securities Exchange Commission, the federal government agency is supposed to oversee people like Madoff, just did a terrible job, a horrible job. And you know, they really, in my view, bear the brunt of the blame. You know, there was greed on the part of investors, but I don't know if you average person thinks 10 or 12 percent a year sounds like it's not 100 percent a year. You know, it sounded reasonable, and the SEC again and again missed uh, people complaining, whistleblowers, tips. They just didn't do a very good job. Do you think Americans are smarter as a result of this, smarter investors as a result of this? I'm just, I guess what I'm getting at is, do we learn lessons from the kind of <clears throat> investigative reports that you bring to us? Well, you'd think so, um, but 
you know, I think in this case, with, you know, with Madoff, do you, do you, if, if the SEC had investigated, and not only did they investigate, but they sort of gave him a clean bill of health, if you saw that, you'd say, I'm hanging my hat on, on that. The SEC said he's okay. Well, who am I to say, you know, any, any differently? So I'm not sure that people, you know, there's, I'm sure there's skepticism now. I was at a panel recently in New York where people were boasting, you yeah, well, my guy lost money, as if that was a great thing, because they knew he was honest because he lost money. But, um, you know, I don't know that we've really learned those lessons. So those are tough lessons to learn. I mean, we're, you know, we have money, you want to invest it, you know, you're not looking to make a killing, but you'd like it to do well. And so if someone can do that year after year, and he's able to, has he had the lifestyle that suggested great success, homes everywhere, fancy cars. You know, How could this all be smoke jets. and mirrors? Hey, can it really all be smoke and mirrors? And he passed himself off as a man, he was you know, impeccably dressed. You know, uh, London tailored suits, and in fact, when he, it's funny, when, when he'd buy clothes, he'd buy seven of each item. And he'd have one uh, for each of the four homes, and then he had three steamer trunks at three hotels, London, Paris, and San Francisco, where he had the same set of clothes. So he always had the same clothes, and he dressed sort of like a French diplomat, you know, a little rosette in the lapel, and uh, very conservative, kind of, uh, he adopted that old money look with his stolen money. What are you working on now? I've got a couple of great stories coming up on, uh, for World News and for Nightline, another one for 2020, taking me out of the country. Uh, and it's a full range of stories that involve uh, some pretty world-class scams, uh, some troubling things that have been done in the name of the U.S. in the national security world in this administration and past, and uh, whatever else comes down the pike. And we're taking a hard look at uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, which uh, is supposed to assure safe and uh, affordable housing, and you know, lots of money has been wasted there, and and be going into pockets. And worse than that, uh, people have been forced to live in slums. You know, the federal government is a slumlord, which I think is a despicable situation. So we're we're on that. Brian Ross, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Brian Ross. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find an excerpt from Ross's book, The Madoff Chronicles. I'm Patty Satalia. Join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.